interesting tonight and uh, the five pillars of the Kenya Kwanzaa administration that is the bottom up economic transformation agenda uh, agricultural transformation which has been allocated just over 60 billion shillings in the budget MSME's economy the hustler fund has been allocated just over 10 billion shillings universal health coverage has been allocated the health sector has been allocated about 141 billion shillings affordable housing has been allocated about 35 billion shillings and the digital creative economy has been allocated some 15 billion shillings those are the five pillars of the administration and for the housing agenda the total allocation like i said that 5.2 billion shillings affordable housing is taking 3.2 billion shillings social housing 3.3 billion shillings Kenya Urban Program, 7.3 billion shillings. KMRC, that is the Kenya Mortgage Refinancing Company, 5 billion shillings. And Slums Improvement Phase 2 has been allocated 5.5 billion shillings. We'll be engaging on this. And then also something else to take note of, which is crucial in terms of the revenue collection. The tax revenues by March 2023 in the current financial year were 1.39, or you can call it 1.4 trillion shillings. The non-tax revenue at that time were 293 billion shillings, meaning the total revenue as of March for the current financial year was 1.68 trillion shillings. And this is against a 12-month target of 2.1 trillion shillings. So you can calculate that percentage and you'll be sharing the answers. Um, in a short while, but back here, uh, talking about um, the housing agenda. I don't know what you think, Alex, especially knowing that uh, Kimani Kuria, or Kuria Kimani was here on Tuesday. Now he says that the housing levy is a tax and uh, the money will go to the consolidated fund services, never mind that uh, the promise by P.S. Hinga had been different. But if that is the case, should we see a budget item speaking to that and if it does not exist then what should happen yeah i think we kenyans deserve more information around uh, this thing that has now camouflaged into you know from just being a, a mandatory contribution a contribution to now tax and you know they're calling it as it is now um yes we should also hold the government to account to tell us then how much do they intend to collect uh, from this um, housing fund and just to put it into context you want the employer to contribute 1.5 percent. You want the employee to contribute 1.5 percent as well. Um, the employer is getting this, you know, um, as a shock because they need to then budget where they're going to get the money to support that. Do they lay off uh, some employees as a result? What do they do? And for the employees, then it depends at what level of income you're in because um, if you're squeezed to the point where you just have money to take care of your basic needs, do you also want to add another burden of 1.5% of your basic uh, salary, basic mm -hmm. or gross, in, in fact, another discussion to actually go into the housing fund. And um, the, the recommendations are becoming even more serious because if you were to go by what the departmental committee is recommending, they're suggesting that uh, you don't get a refund of this money, um, hence I guess the reason why they're calling it a tax now. The regulations around how you qualify, again, those are not clear. And um, I'm happy that they are now recommending that um, that housing fund actually comes to effect after uh, the regulations have come into force so that it is more clear as to where this money goes and who it helps and who actually is eligible to, to, to get a house. Even the element of the return that you get out of um, this particular fund is now not clear. In fact, uh, it's been argued that if you're not eligible, you don't even get a, a return on the contributions that you make at all. So it's, um, it's quite a serious issue, and okay. uh, I'm really tracking to see what happens until we get to Finance Act um, 2023. Okay. Uh, um, Dr. Abraham, so what, what should happen um, yeah. when you have a new source of tax revenue not reflected in the budget estimates? Yeah, uh, f first of all, I think uh, the, the whole housing thing uh, yeah. is uh, as confused as it looks. I don't think it is well thought out uh, because the dance from the first time it was announced to today, when finally we co got to learn that it's 1.5% of gross pay has been quite significant. That tells you that there's actually no policy, there's no direction in terms of how but let's give credit to the government because this is not a new idea. There are already houses that are being constructed. There's already a budget, actually, uh, that you may have seen, I think, of about 3.25 billion 
uh, already there's a housing program that is already continuing as we talk and we have seen president actually launch some projects mm -hmm. uh, for for that uh, for me is that any fund that you are creating has to be based on a need an identified need um, and uh, I think it was in this place again where we actually go back to our statistics and we say that if you want to build houses for Kenyans, then you need to ask yourself, what is the need you're trying to respond to? The, respo the, the need for Kenyans around housing is not houses per se, it's an income issue. Because you also have, let's look at the numbers, 20% of uh, are Kenyans in urban areas mm -hmm. are the only ones who own the houses they live in. The other majority rent because of what comes with owning a house and a home, as it were, in an urban area. 80% in the rural area own the homes they live in. You know, uh, our parents, people, some of us even have our houses in the village where we don't necessarily, necessarily stay. And therefore, what that tells you that uh, 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 when you say you're going to build houses across all the constituencies, that's not. So what I thought could have happened is, first of all, put this, first of all, as a program. Under, just like all the other programs that have been done under the National Housing Corporation. Why it is not being housed under National Housing Corporation and now in the Ministry of Housing, the State Department for Housing, is already you know, concerning, concerning enough. Two, you need to develop the regulations around it, and then it becomes an, a factor of the people who need that kind of houses. And why I say that is because there are also other mechanisms that are available, mm -hmm. one of which is to make mortgage more affordable, so that then people can buy the kind of houses they want and government does housing, you know, the, 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 the social and the mechanisms around it. Mm -hmm. What I see in this, so it, it, without that, I don't think government has any right to charge this levy. Two, what is a levy? A levy is paid for by the people consuming that service. In as much as where you spend that money can be redistributed to the rest of the society. Mm -hmm. Let's take an example of the railway levy. You will not pay for the railway levy unless you buy petroleum products, for instance. That's where the levy is, is, is charged. But where that money is spent, when you go to, for instance, use the railway services, you will not be asked whether you contribute the railway levy. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you will just pay your usual, you know, a transport yeah. cost. Mm -hmm. So you cannot force people who are not likely to consume the service now, because even the language now of who will get a house has gone away. And when it's renamed into a tax? Sorry, of course, when it is remaining into a tax, just like I'm saying as a levy, remember, it's danced around the language, the words. Mm. You know, the initial word was a housing fund. You tax the people who can afford, those who have incomes, and you provide houses. Some of them are likely to get those houses, and then a part of it you build social housing for mm -hmm. the people who cannot, who cannot afford. Once it becomes a tax, then it means that I have no right to ever claim that is a free, con I mean, it's a contribution I've put, and once it's put in the consolidated service, it can be redistributed for any other purpose, including not housing. Mm. So, so unless we have a very clear structure, you cannot deduct money you know, from anyone, uh, uh, especially in the pretext that you will give them housing. Okay, uh, all, all right. Yeah. Just the addition I'd make, because uh, I totally concur with that, is yes, government needs to fix it, take the time to fix it and then reintroduce it because I think very few Kenyans object to this. It's a noble idea. What are the risk factors? Look at uh, the NSSF, look at the NHIF, accountability. So they need to look at, and you know, around housing, the risks are many. Mm -hmm. There's risks around, around the land, there are also questions around the land. You know, some of this land is held by counties. Some of it has been grabbed. Some of it may be grabbed if we are not careful. Who, is, who are the contractors? We saw the scandals that were around, you know, came around the, the affordable housing with the previous administration not too long ago. Right. Some of the insinuations in media. So we need to ensure that the supply chain and the distribution chains are open and accountable. So why do, doesn't government take the time to fix it and give us a good uh, system that Kenyans can say yes we are being urged to be patriotic but we're not pa no one's patriotic about throwing their money mm -hmm. um, down a, a hole and, and for you the proposed changes to the bill by the Finance and Planning Committee that uh, you remove the cap of 5,000 shillings and uh, now keep it 1.5% of whatever amount that you earn 
It sees as being that you can take back your resources, but now you it's just a tax. It's a contribution. Mm. It's a contribution mm. uh, to to government, right? Just like any other tax that we pay. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't. I, I I, I struggle with that because then it becomes a forced contribution. Okay. Because the initial idea is that you will gain, you will get, first of all, either an interest, the initial idea, we will get an interest from your money, mm -hmm. how, uh, however contentious that is, right. at least you'll get your money back or you'll transfer it to retirement. Mm -hmm. Two, when you make it a 1.5%, remember this is not the only thing you are raising. The NHIF has also moved to 2.7, the proposal is to move it to 2.75%. Right, without in a, a cap. Without, with, without a cap. Mm -hmm. So basically what you're saying, that 4.2%, at least from the employee, mm -hmm. is going to go, you know, is going basically to be spent. You're saying for somebody perhaps, you know, uh, uh, who is at 100,000, already you can see it's about 4,200 right. uh, Kenya shillings of money that they, you know, they, they are contributing. They'll never see again. Uh, they'll never, they'll never, never see, see again. Uh, but allow me to say something I wanted to say earlier. Okay, you, can, can you first uh, finish by getting okay, the response <laughs> from Honorable <laughs> Nero here? By all means. And I know you also have very many issues that you don't <laughs> respond, but, but can you first uh, remain on that line of um, the housing um, levy, tax, contribution, or whatever it will become eventually. The essence of the recommendation, which is by the Finance Committee, has now this become the policy of the government, that it's a tax? Let me answer it this way. And I'll ask, answer it, number one, with a question, which is rhetorical. Number one, do we actually need the housing program in Kenya? I think my answer is, we need it. Why do we need it? We need it, number one, because it's not just purely an income issue about housing. In my opinion, as Dr. Ruho is insinuating, it is also a dignity issue. It is also an economic issue about especially backward integration that is involved around housing. If then we need it, let's go to the next step. The next step is how do we achieve it? We made a proposal or the government made a proposal that came to parliament and it was tabled. Then after that, the debate was opened up for every other Kenyan with any opinion that could enrich not just the housing levy, but the entire finance bill. That was done for two long weeks. We were in the same place with the Honorable Kimani Kuria's committee. They were sitting from morning up to late at night. Many Kenyans volunteered their opinions and their information. After that then, we have to be very clear-minded that the issue about consulting the Kenyan people is not just about a matter of luxury. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of whether you think you'll do this or, or that. Mm -hmm. It is enshrined in the Constitution. Right. So I want to make it very clear mm -hmm. that some of the proposals that have been made by the Finance Committee mm -hmm. have actually come from the Kenyan public. And maybe that is the reason why sometimes, with all due respect to mm -hmm. my colleagues here, because they are my friends and honorable people, Sometimes it is said, if you want to mix up things, then if you call experts, you'll get as many answers as the experts. Mm -hmm. Why am I saying that? I was in this TV station last week. One of a very pronounced expert, who was very eloquent, actually spoke for the exact thing the committee did. Mm -hmm. So the committee thought several things around it. Number one, in terms of removing the cup, it was discriminatory previously because it was 3%, then there was a cap of 5,000. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. That the people at the lower cadre, the people with low incomes, then they were carrying the burden of the people with larger incomes because proportionately they were paying much more than the rest. You understand up to there? So what is the intention here? To raise the money or to inflict pain equally? The intention here Gituko, and I want to make it very clear. We are very categorical about creating jobs. Not just in terms of people in the construction site, mm -hmm. but also in terms of backward integration in the industries that are involved. And that is why you see, whatever we are doing around housing has also some other backing policies in other areas. 
When you see clinker being touched somewhere around the policy, it is the whole chain around housing. Why? We want, as we do this housing, that we do not then do houses. We see monuments of houses, then no multiply effect within the economy, like the, the, the infamous SGR. That is why we are protecting every other opportunity backwards within the economy. But, but, but I thought what I saw with Klinka is um, <coughs> imposition of a, a tax, is it excess tax, of 10% um, and also taxing imported cement. Mm. You know, it's a huge debate and I wish we had much more time. Mm -hmm. That Klinka uh -huh. has something to do with this housing project because we have, we have enough Klinka and enough installed, installed capacity to produce enough Klinka in Kenya. So, so, you're, so you're discouraging imports? We are discouraging imports because we want to protect every gain that comes through the housing program to be insulated to the Kenyan people. If so, we had time, I would have <laughs> run you through, so, but so, I'm, I'm, can I <laughs> let me finish. <laughs> can I finish? I'll allow him to finish. <laughs> Please note it down so that you don't and, lose and, it. And, and, and we are doing it consciously so that we protect all the, the, mm. the, all, all the gains. Mm. Now, I don't want to, to sound uh, very theoretical, mm -hmm. but there is a correlation between home, home ownership and how economies have progressed. Yes. We have always given, it. it's almost becoming mm -hmm. a banality. Mm -hmm. For example, if you look at Singapore, it was cited here, I was in the same st station, it is around 90%. Mm -hmm. South Korea is still doing very well, around 70%. If you look at China, China is also doing much well, past almost closing 80%. Mm -hmm. What are we doing? Why are we not talking about rural homes per se? There is also a very clear correlation between urbanization and economic growth. In 1990, for example, Chinese people, two thirds of them were living in rural areas. Mm -hmm. But currently, and if you look at their per capita income, their per capita GDP was a partly small figure. Currently, it is a multiple of that. As we talk now, close to three quarters of the Chinese people live in urban areas. And I'm going back to the same debate that I had. Okay. In rural setups, for example, we encourage primary production because people are scattered. Primary production, unfortunately, it ends up employing so many people, but productivity is lower. Sometimes we are not able to distinguish between unemployment, having people in jobs, okay. but also having productive jobs. And that is the same reason, for example, yes. if you look at the economy, and I'm saying so many things at the same time because of time. <laughs> if you look, for example, yes. if you look, for example, at Vietnam, uh. Vietnam before uh, pre-COVID was the country with the lowest unemployment rate in the world. But if you look at the GDP figures, number one in terms of GDP per capita, but also in terms of uh, incomes, it was still much lower. Okay. Why? The productivity. So, 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 Hona Bonyoro, answer my initial question. So. There's that proposal that housing will be a tax, meaning it's mandatory and it can go as high as your salary is, but you don't find it in the budget. So what will happen once this money is received in the consolidated fund? Number one, the reason why we have not put it in the budget is because we are responsible and we follow the law. We could not put it in the budget yet, yet the, the, uh, that particular law has not yet gone through the full throttle. We are waiting for that to happen. After that, Treasury is the custodian of our national resources. Once people start contributing, what we have at the back of our mind is that we are going to reinvest that money. But by the time we go there, we we'll already have dealt with the law in terms of once we contribute this money, and I want to persuade you and also to clarify to the Kenyan people, yet, yes, as it is now, it is a tax. It is going to the consolidated fund. But the plan that we have is that we are going to isolate insulate this money, reinvest this money, so that it purely goes to the intention of a housing program, not purely for people to own houses alone, but because we also want to harness the backward integration so, so, so that is yeah. involved in the housing uh, program. So I hear that, but will there be supplementary budgets that to account for it, or it doesn't have to be? Or it will be. What will happen is this. Once we pack this money, and all these people know, in the Treasury now, even currently, there is something we call budget reserves, which we actually pack money, especially for emergencies or unforeseen situations. Mm -hmm. There is nothing wrong with packing this money as we make the rule, but we may not actually have to pack the money. The reason why it is not purposely in the estimates is because, you know, 
This month is usually a marathon for government. We are dealing with estimates, that is the expenditure side of the government. At the same time, we are dealing with the revenue side, mm. which also encompasses policies that some of them necessitate change of law. So as we move towards, it's every, every part is moving. Okay. But some, we cannot some, be starting. I, 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 I think, let me get reactions. I, I, think, I think it would be right to say yeah. it is wrong. It is wrong. The approach the chairman of the budget committee is approach, uh, suggesting here is completely wrong. It is not in the PFM Act. There is no way you can collect money without a framework, a legal framework of why you are collecting that money. It is, you are saying it's a tax. It is not against a budget estimate. It is not against a line that you want to spend. I mean, what is that? I mean, if it's not broad daylight, uh, kind of almost, I mean, uh, you know, uh, theft by law, <laughs> you know? Robbery because, without I mean, violence. It's honest, because on what grounds do you collect money from Kenyans? Now he's saying, oh, you know, it's because there are so many things that are going on. Yes, there are so many things going on. That's a fact. You know, we are in a very tight time. But why do you want to collect money? Then you keep it somewhere, you know, somewhere in some, some, some fund, you know, loosely. Then we come and it doesn't work like that. There is no other mm. fund that has been created in this country that runs on that. The budget reserves he's talking about, COVID showed us that that's those budget reserves are actually on paper. There's actually no money. You remember the kind of scampering we had to do when COVID <laughs> hit? Well, the contingency fund was actually empty. It's a fact. Okay. You know? okay. I mean, so for mm. me, yes. I think we need to call it out for what it is. And, the yeah. more, and as I said, the more we are having the conversation, mm -hmm. the more it is emerging that actually there was actually no thought about what this exactly is okay. and what it is. But let me also say yeah. that the discussion about the housing fund and the housing project creating employment, I have not seen any numbers to suggest how much employment we are creating. Two, in a world of, mod I mean, of technology, you're not going to be having people carrying stones to 10th floor. You're going to be using equipment. So the number of people, you have been to construction sites, and you find 50 people, because a lot of the work is mechanized, and mm -hmm. you want to do these projects you know, in a, in a okay. way that, that, that you know. Okay. And thirdly, if you want to really create homes, why don't you support the supply side of private sector and work on the incomes for people to buy the kind of homes they want? Who said everybody wants to live you okay. know, uh, in, 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 in? I, I want to get reactions from yeah. uh, Alex yeah. and Wanjiro. Let's yeah. start okay. with you, Alex. Just three quick points. Mm -hmm. um, number one, I was part of the team that was uh, giving Honorable Kuria and um, the Departmental Finance Committee comments around this housing fund. Mm -hmm. I spent a whole day there. I think by the time I was making my presentation, it was late in the night. So I hear um, Hesh say that they actually listened to the public. That day, if they actually listened to the public, <sighs> Then they, they ought to have removed this housing fund in its everybody entirety. Said, said in fact, the only, only people who are coming close to kind of liking it, they were saying, make it voluntary. So mm. if they listen to the public, I really, really doubt if they listened. Two is that uh, when you go to iTax on the KRA platform for accounting for tax, my guy, they are ready to actually receive these funds <laughs> within iTax. And um, the law actually was saying that the housing fund um, should take effect from 1st of July. So in terms of a platform and the Revenue Authority getting ready for it, they are ready for it. I'm hoping the departmental committee then saves us by saying, <laughs> wait for the regulations. Mm -hmm. And finally, I was doing some maths around um, who will be hurt most if this thing is not, an, uh, is not capped. So from my mathematics, anyone earning 166,600 Kenya shilling if you do the 1.5%, that's when you arrive at the about 2,500 that was initially proposed. Mm -hmm. So if the capping is removed, anyone who earns more than this 166, uh, 600,000 uh, Kenya shilling, then you're actually going to contribute more. Mm. And for that, what do you get? Because you're earning this much, then you won't be eligible for that house. Mm -hmm. Because um, having experience from another housing, uh, housing project that is being done by the government, it is being capped at guys who are earning 150,000 and below. Those are the only ones who can qualify okay. for affordable houses. So if mm -hmm. you earn 166, 600, you're already locked out, out of this. So I think we need some more thinking around this housing fund. Okay. And perhaps, uh, as uh, Dindi says, they should listen. Yeah. Right. Okay. And, and just, yes, to, just associating with that entirely, and, and you know, like I said earlier, we are seeing some 
characteristics or patterns that are eerily disturbing of what we saw with the Uhuru Ruto um, Uhuru administration, which is um, this lack of policy. This going into one, proliferation of funds, and then moving into projects without policy. Let's go back to one of our first transformative policies that we had in this country, which was the free primary education, which I'm not sure exists anymore. After 10 years of um, the Uhuru administration and coming in with this administration, FPE is no longer FPE. Parents mm -hmm. are paying you know, quite a lot of money to get their kids educated at primary level. Secondary school level, it's almost collapsed. And at uh, tertiary level, um, you, we can see the changes. IMF-inspired um, removal of the support for um, Kenyans to be able to access um, free, well, supported, sponsored um, tertiary education. So what did uh, the Kibaki administration do with the election promise? They threw it to Kipra. And Kipra churned it around. They might have not even has, have done as much public participation mm -hmm. as has been done by this administration because it's commendable. But they put the experts together. And please, Honorable uh, uh, Nyoro, don't tell us that um, you know experts confuse issues. Experts have a role. <laughs> the problem we have with development <laughs> in Africa is that we borrowed Western models. We are listening to Bretton Woods um, organizations about how to grow, um, to grow the continent. And of course, we have corruption. But the main thing is we don't have the thinking. We must protect and invest in the thinking. And that happens at policy. So what, the, what really should have happened, instead of parliament trying to struggle with this thing, because you've done your public participation, take all those issues and throw them to Kipra. And tell Kipra, give us a solution. What does that do? It has legitimacy. Mm -hmm. Because Kipra is independent, it's not going to be, you know, you don't think this is a political fund. They will also look at the social dynamics, they will look at the risk factors. They'll say to make this happen, okay. uh, you have the option of going through N N uh, the National Housing Corporation. We also have an urbanization policy through the county governments. Mm -hmm. They will create those linkages, they'll create the linkages with the informal sector so that you have a comprehensive solution. Right now, we are operating in a very risky way and it is irresponsible okay. of our policymakers to bring us half-baked proposals and try to get Kenyans to pay for those half-baked proposals. So please, let us put some discipline oh, oh, right, in terms of the policy proposals. Honorable Nyoro, as you respond to the concerns raised here, I'm, I'm just wondering, at what point does the government stop? Because we have <laughs> National Housing Insurance Fund just about to go up. We have a fuel levy to build roads. We have a railway levy to build railway and maintain it. Shall we get, now there's a housing levy or tax or whatever it is to build houses. Shall we get to a point to have water levy to build dams? <laughs> education yeah. levy to finance education? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, Sam, um, it is not good that we trivialize. No, no, it's not trivialized. I'm just asking, but these are what, what is the reason? What is the problem? It is not it is not good that we trivialize such important agendas that we have. I've listened to all my brothers and sisters here, and I've also listened to your question. Yes, we have all these levies. We have fuel levy. We have all those kind of levies. Mm -hmm. Why do levies exist? Why are they there? They are there because the money collected through these levies need to be insulated for the greater proportion of the gains to go to those who actually pay for those levies. It is when you, for example, tax people through VAT, the monies that go to consolidated FAD, that is a form of redistribution. Because it is that money that the government actually uses to extend pure public goods and services. But the monies that are insulated into some levies, they are insulated because those who actually pay the highest price need also to enjoy the gain. Mm -hmm. And the reason why, you see, for example, fuel levy, mm -hmm. most of that money goes into the repair, the maintenance and of our roads. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it is the roads that carry most of the fuel in terms of consumption. So levies exist for that uh, purpose. Right. I want to say that, yes, there can be a net to, uh, to levies, and we hope, for example, this could be the last one. But we need to understand that
that this levy is not a pain point, a pain point to Kenyans. Mm -hmm. There is a thought behind it. And when I was listening to my sister here, Wajiro, you could always imagine that government and treasury has got no people with brain. Because yes, I had your recommendation, throw this to Kipra, throw, throw this to the other one. Because Do you know, by the way, Kipra receives funding from taxpayers? I hope you know that. Correct. Kipra yes. is actually a government. Yes. W what makes people think that we don't actually involve Kipra? Every other person is involved. And also in terms of why do we need to throw this to the other person, the expert we have in Kenya in terms of the constitution, the highest expert we must listen to is the people. Mm -hmm. That is why public participation is very pivotal. And I am just repeating myself. Mm -hmm. I was in this kind of a show last week here. One of the people we were with, an expert, mm -hmm. actually proposed the same. So when you hear maybe you took this view to this committee, they never took your view. It is important, yes. But they had to put it in a balance on where is it actually falling? Where is more it? Is it more it? Is more it between uh, uh, having this as a reduced percentage but also becomes a tax, or retaining it at a higher percentage that also uh, remains as a fact that you get uh, back your, your money? But also, mm -hmm. that issue about why am I being forced? And I've heard it from Dr. Rugo. Dr. Rugo here knows when you are employed, and especially in informal sector, Formally employed, I mean, mm -hmm. whether in public or private, you pay, pay. Correct. The people who have payrolls in Kenya are below 4 million Kenyans. 3.2. Exactly. Why is that debate not the same there? That why am I being taxed because I have a salary? But, why but, don't but, you but, have but, the but, same but, argument? Because, because in Number this two, case, yeah, Number two, let me finish. Number two, it's a speculative For example, you have corporate tax. Argument here. Corporate tax, how many corporates do you have in Kenya? They pay taxes, which then we redistribute, some of which is funding education. Why then not have that argument let, around let, this let table? This. No, that no, no, then no. I, think, I think we need to put some things straight. Mm. The reason why the, this tax has an issue, and I can come even to the issue around what we have issues with the payee and the rest, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. some of which the, the minister tried to speak to. Uh, and of course, that has to do with you know just not honouring the you know the social contract and not providing the services. You know the 700 billion or so that gets lost. We can come to that. But the housing levy, the housing tax, the housing contribution, the national chama, according to the PS, uh, that he you know he, he I think it was just a casual statement he was making, is based on a speculation. It's based on a promise that if you put in this money, we will get you a house. That's what government is committing itself. It's actually putting itself on the line and mm -hmm. saying we will get you a house. And therefore, in that kind of a, this is a specific service. It's like you going and putting in your money <coughs> in a depositor's account and you are promised 8%. You cannot come back and then they tell you, ah, you know, uh, the market <laughs> didn't go very well, so we decided to give uh, the first 50 people. Uh, it's not a gamble, you know? Right. And two, I am making a contribution knowing very well that I'm, I'm going to get. So when you turn it into a tax, if you, I mean, why not then increase pay if okay. that, that's, a, that's a goal? OK, you know? I, I want us to tie this because you're coming towards the end of our time. Um, Sam, look, I feel uh, that just hold on. Honorable please, Nyono please, please. also trivialized the point I made yeah. about the need for policy. Yeah. The thing of running straight to um, first of all, here there's no legislation, but yeah. you know there was talk about going to regulation without a policy framework. And then Honorable Nyoro seems to imply that public participation does away with the need for policy. Those two are not, uh, okay. you know, there's no contradiction between the two. Oh, they right. both belong in the framework. Let's take a moment and reflect on what also the budget statement by the cabinet secretary talks about, that um, there'll be two extra bands of taxation, that is Correct. pay as yeah. you earn, yeah. Yeah. 500 to 800, 800 going to 32%, and then 800 and above 35%. Then you say the 1.5% housing, as far as it can go, if it's 800,000, then you can do the math. Are you concerned that recently there's a new funding model for education that came out, and it says that um, if you're poor, the government is going to finance your children's education. If you're wealthy, um, you're able, then what it will mean is that um, the government will give a scholarship of 38%, 58, 55% will be given to in form of a loan, 7% will be 
raised by the family. So what does that do? It means that if you're a high income earner, then you have less access to education, whether it's basic or higher education. Then it comes to NHIF and you say that uh, NHIF, if you have uh, medical cover by your employer, then you're limited at how much benefit you can get from NHIF, but the rate is going to 2.75% funded by the employee. So all these, fuel levy, VAT, all, all those things, um, consumption tax, you're taxing those that are working, mm. but the benefit is not commensurate. How do you respond to that? I don't think that is correct and accurate. Fuel levy does, there's no way fuel levy targets those people who have uh, salaries. No, I'm simply if saying, actually take no, let, me, let me explain this. I'm exactly. simply saying, if you're in this tax ban that you're talking about, I have you're most likely driving. So you buy more fuel than Correct. the person who's using a matatu. That's I have what I'm talking about. First of all, we have to look at ourselves as a country comparatively. It has been said, and I want to repeat, there is a correlation between countries that do well and offer pure public goods that are a quality and revenue collection in terms of what people pay to the government. There is a clear correlation. Correct. OECD countries, for example, it was cited by the president, I want to repeat, OECD countries, a club of 37 countries, they are uh, contribution in terms of revenue to government is around 34.4% of their GDP. Currently, Kenya, even with the taxes, even with the measures that we are incorporating, we are only moving to 16.7% thereabout. But that does not take away the point that, that those people who are paying must not continue to be overtaxed. And that is why I don't want to go to the other debate that I already had out, that even as much as we are collecting these taxes, from those people at the higher bar, we are also making policies and mechanisms through allocation of money in the budget and through policies to incorporate as many Kenyans as possible to be taxpayers. And I made that point before, give the example of the primary production, what you're doing, and also industry and all the others. But then, let us now come to what are we doing with this money? Because we cannot act, mm -hmm. please give me a minute. We cannot keep talking about you are collecting this, we are collecting that, without clarifying to Kenyans what is this money actually going to do. We are in, out of the 3.679 trillion budget. We are leaving 2.3 trillion to the national government, that is parliament and the uh, judiciary incorporated. Mm. Out of that money, 27.4% of that, which is 630 billion Kenya shillings, is going to education. And I want to also to address the issue that I had with my sister here, that in terms of deficiencies in investing in social programs. As you know, education, as much as it is an economic program, it is also massively a social program because it's a matter of uh, equality. Mm. We, are at, we are putting in 630 billion, much away from the previously allocated 544 last financial year. What are we allocating this money to? JSS last financial year, had an allocation of 15.5 billion Kenya shillings. We are adding 10 billion and making it 25.5 billion Kenya shillings. Help, you've just mentioned about recalibration of the higher education funding. We are topping up help. Actually, we are increasing help allocation by 100%. From last year's allocation of 15 billion Kenya shillings mm -hmm. to 30 billion. Right. What more are we doing in terms of um, uh, having as many Kenyans become participants of the economy and also enjoy this cake that we are baking now through the taxes. I talked about fertilizer for our farmers mm -hmm. and I want to dissuade my brother about agriculture because we could have taken much more time there about how much are we allocating, is it sufficient? Mm -hmm. In terms of agriculture, most times we focus on farming. Farming is just a segment of what we call agriculture. Correct. And farming actually accounts for only 25% of agriculture as a, as a sector. We are adding much more money, 9.4 billion Kenya shillings in terms of aggregation centers with code rooms. Why? As we talk about production here in terms of agriculture, through the value chain of agriculture, once you leave farming, you go to something called post-harvest management. Mm -hmm. Around that sphere, farmers lose over 30% of their produce. We have allocated much more money there. We have allocated money to hire 8,000 graduates, fresh graduates, to volunteer in government as interns, and they'll be paid 25,000 shillings per month. Okay. We have actually doubled that kitty. 
We have allocated money into our KMTCs, 21 of them that are not operational, in terms of hiring more trainers and in terms of operationalizing. Okay. We have allocated money to hire 20,000 more teachers. We have allocated money to help one for one billion Kenya shillings. So I'm putting this to context. <laughs> and I'm, by I'm the sure, way, I'm I can sure say these things up to morning. <laughs> yes, but it is important, I, Sam, I, I trust as we can. talk about this tax, it's still let us also trace it. Honorable. Where is it going? It's still 4% yeah. of Just the so budget, <laughs> not the 8%. It should be <laughs> healthy. Can, can 6% can instead of the 15%. The feedback that has come to us because yeah. I want to hear what Alex has to say about collection of uh, taxes versus availability of resources and how they are distributed to different agencies, whether it's education or it's the counties. The feedback that has come to us via Twitter at Citizen TV Kenya, at Sam Gituku, the hashtag to use this tonight. Um, I almost said something else. Malongo Brian is saying that um, how, do we, how do we shift from our current economic system which is exhausting resources and causing serious long-term crisis to a more sustainable one. How can you establish an economy that will benefit our children and grandchildren? You can note some of this, you can respond to them as we close. Kipron Abraham is saying that we should also reduce expenditure on capital projects and those that don't directly impact positively on our economy. We rather, would rather have a budget of 2.5 trillion that we can finance without borrowing then have ambitious one that we must borrow to finance. Um, Babu Michael, as we give the Kenya Kwanzaa government benefit of doubt, they should take this opportunity to do things differently and prove wrong all those they say are peddling lies and propaganda about the government uh, policies. We are keenly on the watch. And then <coughs> Nixon, you said that I embrace what Professor Njugun Ndungu said when answering members of the press, the debts are okay so long as there is value for them. It's my prayer. The proper utility of funds or taxes will boost our morale to live and love our country, Kenya. I want to begin with you, Alex, as you reflect on that feedback, but also quickly on uh, why we keep struggling to send money to schools, uh, to send money to counties, to an extent that counties now are demanding about 94 billion shillings, and the financial year is ending in 15 days. Yeah, basically, if uh, you haven't collected anything, then there's nothing to distribute. It's plain and simple as that. Um, so why budget? <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, perhaps, you, hence the reason why people are also asking then, why do we need to also increase our, our budgets all along when we know we don't have collect much or we cannot get um, external assistance the way mm -hmm. we used to because foreign governments also have their own um, problems. But you must budget. At the end of the day, um, having been an accountant also, um, there's no way you can project into the future without budgeting and hoping that perhaps you'll get money out mm -hmm. of your sources of income and to the government, of course, looking to tax as one of them. Um, hence the reason you should actually budget. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Rugo, uh, as we close, yeah. so where do we go from here? Uh, I, I think uh, one is that we have uh, elected for ourselves uh, a constitution that has got a framework that requires us to account and spend public resources prudently. Uh, I am still very keen to hear what Kenya Kwanzaa has to do in terms of dealing with wastage, um, um, uh, wastage and corruption. Mm -hmm. um, well, if the last figures are anything to go by, two billion per day, you have about 700 billion. It's equivalent to the deficit. Uh, we are trying to basically we are we are planning to borrow what we are losing in wastage and graft. Mm -hmm. uh, if you fix that alone, it is even more than what you're trying to raise in terms of taxes of 400 billion. So the accountability question cannot run away. Two, I think um, our policy makers and leaders need to appreciate the duality of citizenship. Right. The duality of citizenship means that you are also a consumer of the very policies that you are making. Uh, and therefore, I, I don't think it is right uh, uh, to, to, to assume a high tower kind of uh, you know, uh, a position, uh, yet, Kenyans are feeling the pain. The fact is that Kenyans are feeling the pain. They, I mean, I'm sure even the policymakers are feeling the pain. Uh, it's just that, you know, I mean, they have to play the role they need to play. And thirdly, this is not a revenue problem. This is an expenditure problem. You cannot continue raising your expenditure and your income is not improving. You will finally get to a deadlock. You will Fuliza, you'll go to Tala, you'll go to Branch, and finally you will be, you'll have no options than to start selling your TV and your radio and your house. I worry that by the kind of expansionist budget we have for this particular year, especially because this year is a special year. 
we are having to pay uh, the euro bond. God bless uh, it and rest it in peace uh, because it never arrived most of it. Uh, but we have to pay for it 240 billion. And that's why our, we have a lot of huge payment payout this year. I had expected that we will be more serious about cutting. And the president had announced that we will cut 300 billion. Mm. 300 billion. And even moving forward, we will mm. reduce. We will reduce that. Finally, okay. Kenyans have a right to receive the services for the amount, even if the taxation remained at the same level as last year. They have a right to get those services. We cannot pay taxes and still provide for ourselves services privately that should be provided publicly. Education, healthcare, and all these uh, 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 you know, you know, services. And very, very final, we have a devolution system. Okay. I do not know why the national government is so concerned about running with county functions. Housing is a county function. Healthcare is a county function. Agriculture is a county function in terms of implementation. Why can't they just put this more money where decisions can be made so that the people of Lamu can invest in the agriculture that matters for them? Okay. That the people, so for me, let's just be good human beings and, and do the right thing. This thing will come to be a blessing to us okay. or a burden. Thank you very much. I hear you. That might be very contentious. Onjiro, <laughs> in closing. Yes, very hard to add, you know, to add on to that, and I agree, and I'll start on the devolution part. Um, government appears to be duplicating the devolved structure, underfunding it uh, by refusing to increase uh, the quantum to devolution. devolution. Devolved government, with all the functions it holds, is receiving less money than our de uh, local uh, decentralized system did before the passage of the Constitution. We were at 27% of revenue generated uh, locally. Uh, now uh, um, the devolved governments are at 9% of, of the budget. Mm -hmm. um, so when in, in refusing to fund uh, a government system, and creating alternative mechanisms. What are they doing? They are increasing the administrative costs. They are increasing the confusion, reducing the accountability, because these frameworks also are not monitored. They are not measured. Um, we, the last time we had a comprehensive public expenditure review was in uh, 2017. I'm still awaiting the one for the last five years. So we have a lot of good ideas. Okay. Kenya Kwanzaa has a lot of good ideas, but they are very weak in terms of their delivery systems and accountability systems. And they need to make our systems work by putting the money in the right place. The right. second point, prioritization. We saw over the last 10 years that by the wrong priorities, um, we had the Uhuru Ruto administration that was able to re reverse, almost reverse the gains mm -hmm. of the previous 10 years. Even though under the NAC administration we had a lot of political contestation, mm -hmm. the economy was still very vibrant. And you know, the first five years of the administration, in fact, until 2020, it wasn't external factors. Those were mismanagement factors okay. because of the wrong priorities. So I really, I think uh, much as we are quite critical on Rabonyoro, we are Kenyans, we are patriotic, and we want to assist and say, please, let's look at prioritization because priorities are driven by rent-seeking and interests. And those rent-seeking interests will undermine even the best objectives of the Kenya Kwanzaa administration. I think my last point is I really support the transformation that Kenya Kwanzaa has put forward about flipping this economic system entirely. Mm. But I'm disappointed they haven't put money into their own process. They are doing lip service. Okay. Much as uh, Onra Bunyoro has given us a lot of detail, the big ticket items, money talks. Where you put your money, that's where your heart is. And the administration, mm. this administration and the previous administration, their interests are exactly the same. Wow. So I, I would have to be in your shoes, uh, Honobu Nyoro, but I can still give the opportunity, but also to help us understand, so now, what, what next? Uh, because the statement is in the House. I saw the other day the Committee of Supply is passing how much was going to the national government. Uh, or, or, yes, the national government. So what next after Professor Ndongo's statement? What next is the implementation of the budget, and especially after we pass the appropriations bill, which is likely to happen next week? But because it's my time now for the closing remarks, I've been listening to my colleagues here. Mm -hmm. 
and I can't actually tell what exactly, if they were advising anyone, what that person would do. Because when I come to such a show also, I come also to benefit from the knowledge of uh, the dignified people who are here. Why? Am I saying that? The same mouth that says, you have not allocated enough money for this and that, the same same person says, you need to reduce on the expenditure. So I don't know what is the point there then. You say you have not allocated enough money to agriculture, but the same same person says, this budget is of ambitious, you need to reduce on the expenditure. Let me go to specifics. We have been making this budget for the last like six months. We didn't just wake up and patch up a budget. Mm -hmm. We have been meeting with the, all the MDA uh, accounting officers, and I can tell you for sure, the budget for this financial year that we are debating, that is financial year 2023-24, we have made it as a zero-based budget. We started from scratch. If you check this budget, and I want you to, to do some homework, you realize one thing that we did. If you check on something we call O&M, the monies that are recurring and, uh, uh, recurring and salary, you'll see the kind of hit they took. Because you want to reallocate this money, for example, allocated to foreign travel, to domestic travel, to more productive areas, even if they are recurrent, they are recurrent that are a capital in nature. What do I mean by that? For example, when you hire a teacher, yes, this is recurrent, but you are capitalizing education, which is a factor of production. Number two, because I want to answer the Kenyan who, who also raised issues, mm -hmm. reduce on capital projects. I want to assure Kiprono that you actually did so. We allocated 250 billion Kenya shillings into our roads infrastructure across. That is maintenance, that is recurrent, we call it maintenance, uh, development, GOK, and development, de uh, development partners. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we give it so much money, that is 250 billion, unprecedented figure. It has never received that kind of funding. But on the same side, we cut on the new projects. There is almost no new road that we are starting to build because we want the Kenyan people to start enjoying the utility of the projects that are already started. When you build a house at the rental level, you sink in one million shillings, you start enjoying the utility of that house when you roof. That is the same thing that we are doing. We finish up the ongoing projects, and yes, as Kiprono suggested, we have cut on the capital expenditure okay. to focus on that which we need to finish. Michael asked, what are you doing differently? We are doing a lot of things differently. One, we are cutting on the debt in terms of deficit, in terms of aggregate figure. As I said, last financial year was 1.1 trillion. We have brought it down to 718. What else are we de doing different? We are no longer throwing money to projects. We are following value chains. We are tracing a shilling. Let me give an example. If when you come to cotton farming, we are putting in money for BT cotton seeds. We are putting in money for ginary. That is the value chain. Then we come in and put in money to river tax. Then we have put in money to EPZ. The entire value chain, you can trace a shilling you have invested up to the time it is multiplied okay. when it is exiting on the EPZ. On Nixon, debt. Yes, I agree with Professor Dongo. Debt, some countries borrow. But also, countries are different. And that is the same wisdom of our CS. He's actually the best CS that we've ever had for Treasury. Actually, we went to the same small school in Moranga. Uh, but this is the point. Uh, <laughs> this is, this is, is the point. To to <laughs> this is the point. He just made his first uh, budget. Yes. Yeah. He's a very fair man. So I am talking about that. Let me not be subjective. Great yes. minds come let, from let, the let same me become, school. Let, let, close let, let me be, become objective as uh -huh. I close. Mm -hmm. This is my last point. Mm. Why are we on a consolidation path? Why are we, even if we are expansionist in terms of budget, why are we condensing on the areas that we are targeting? Why are we taking the consolidation path? Why? We want to reduce on the borrowing. Why is borrowing bad to Kenya as a country? When you, for example, compare Kenya's borrowing, mm. people compare with the US, they compare with Japan. You have to look at the cost. Our cost of external borrowing is around 7%. Our average cost that is domestic and external is 9 to 10%. You can't compare ourselves with Japan, who, for example, previous years, their 10 year board was in the negative territories, territories in terms of the yield. So you can't compare that. Mm -hmm. Number two, people compare Japan, for example, borrow more. Uh, you can borrow past 62.5%. We are not going to do that. Why? Japan, they borrow from their own funds. 
they borrow cheaply. Mm. They also net off. Okay. Japan, for example, just to say 30 seconds, Japan is the number one leader, and I said that, of the US. So when you talk about you must borrow because other countries borrow, we can't do that. Right. Japan, if you check their economy, mm. they have had no real growth for the last 30 years. Yet they have the highest uh, debt to GDP ratio. That is part of the reason why we will continue as a country maintaining our growth, maintaining our budget by lowering our deficit so that we do not continue digging the hole of deficit, digging the hole of debt. Okay. All right. Um, there's nothing more to add to that. But of course, uh, <coughs> still many days ahead of us to really get into the details of this budget statement and what it will mean come 1st of July 2023. This has been tonight with Onjiru Gikonyo, an advocate of uh, good governance or advocate for gov good governance and accountability. Alex Kanyi, from, who is a partner at uh, CDH Kenya, and also Dr. Abraham Rugo, who is from IBP Kenya, and Dindu Nyoro is the chairperson of the Budget and Appropriations Committee at the National Assembly and also Member of Parliament for Kiharu Constituency. Um, this has been tonight, of course, uh, we had uh, paved way for it so that we can have this discussion. News Gang should be back next week on Thursday. My name is Sam Kichuku. Good night. See you tomorrow.